Hello and welcome to Gabbett Media, I'm Grant Abbott and today I'm going to talk through how I made the Eagle Temple. So this is all part of the work I'm doing for the game Atlas Empires and you can check out my similar tutorials and commentaries in the playlist in the description. And do look at the other playlist as well, sometimes I link to tutorials about texture painting or how to make low poly models like this, so do look out for those. So you can see I'm working on the base here, uh, fairly straightforward, I've mirrored it four times, so in the X and Y axis, uh, therefore I only make, need to make a quarter of the model, and I texture it like that as well, just to save texture area and texture space. These are 512 by 512 maps, uh, so this model gives me a bit more breathing space, but in the previous ones it's had to be the whole set onto one of those 512 by 512 textures. Now you can see me adding loop cuts and things to the base here, but I do merge my vertices afterwards. So I just sort of create the basic shape, use the knife tool a lot, and loop cuts and so forth, but really you just sort of get a rough idea when you're building the shape. The eagle's head was quite tough, and you can see me spending a lot of time on this. But for any low poly modeling like this, you just get the basic shape, and then you just add to it slowly. Try not to add too many polygons, just add them where you need to. It's quite an art in a sense, and you kind of just get used to where you need a cut and where you don't need a cut. And obviously you're trying to keep the polys low, so you don't want to add cuts where you don't need them. You can see I've got n-gons all over the place. That's not a problem, uh, because everything is converted to triangles when you take it across into a game engine. The only problem with that is if you have got a specific face count that you need to keep under, you can't really judge how many faces you've got because an n-gon still counts as one face. You need to triangulate your mesh to see how many faces you've got. I don't like to triangulate my mesh because it's slightly more awkward to model when it's been triangulated. You've just got more cuts and more polys all over the place. The feathers were really tough, so you can see me here working out where I need to put cuts and where I don't. So I'm not putting a cut in for every single feather, I'm just sort of pretending that there's a big notch where one feather might meet another. But not every single feather has topology which defines the shape. So you don't always have to think about uh, how the model is made in terms of its intricacies. You paint those intricacies on, so the tiny feathers I'll be painting on, but I want to give the illusion that it's not solid at the back, so I create a few notches, but only a few. You can see I want it to come in a bit for the beak, so it is slightly defined, and you can see I'm generally getting the shape here, but again, it's not as detailed as the actual um, concept art, uh, and I'll be painting the feathers on to uh, reduce the poly count. The same for the wings at the side. Getting the right shape and size based on the concept art was uh, slow going. For some reason it took me a while, but uh, it's really important that you get the shape right before you start getting on with any details. And you can see at that point, I thought, well, the base doesn't quite suit and match up compared to the concept art, so move things around, adjust them as you need. Adding a few sort of notches and uh, glitches, in a sense, to your mesh will help give it character. So if you've got the polys to spare, then adding a few extra ones just here and there uh, to create a little notch uh, can help. You can see also that on the loop cuts, I often do a loop cut and then join them together and merge them together where, they, where it doesn't matter or where it won't really be seen. You're always thinking about your silhouette, you see. And uh, so look around your model, think about the silhouette, and uh, where you need a tiny notch here and there, that's when you put it in. But the rest of the mesh, try and tidy it up so it's got as few polygons as possible. I'm doing the same thing here. So I sort of bevel an edge and then uh, just cut out those faces and fill in some faces. It's fairly straightforward. It's a nice technique to create a little notch. And notches are quite nice like I say, for character. You can see my mesh needed a lot of tidying up here, but it's fairly simple. You just delete faces and add them back in with the fill face tool. Lots of people uh, seem to get caught up with trying to make it all in quads and uh, keeping their mesh really uh, beautiful topology. But in low poly work like this, where it's going to be painted on, you really don't have to worry too much. Even uh, when it comes down to the smooth shading, you can see those bowls look horrendous at the moment. There's too much smooth shading going on. But when you get your texture on there, you highlight the edges and you create the crevices uh, with multiply and screen brushes, which I always tend to use. I actually decide to move away from the concept art a little bit at this point. I was going to put uh, more 
bricks in the base as there is in the concept art, which you can see on the right hand side there. But I felt it wasn't quite necessary and it was adding uh, too much uh, polygons for not much gain. So uh, Chris is fine with me doing that where I need to change the shape very slightly or make some adjustments to save on polygons. Uh, he's happy with me to do that. Uh, and we seem to have a good understanding about uh, what's needed. I think that's really important when you're working with people is the communication aspects and to just be okay when changes are asked for. I've known lots of well, people I've worked with who get really grumpy when there's a change made and they have to do things over. That's just part of freelancing. That's part of how these things work. And you as a freelancer need to work with clients and uh, be accepting of those changes and therefore you will get employed again because you'll be someone that's easy to work with. This part is for the broken down Eagle Temple. So you can see I'm sort of making a broken up mesh here. I was experimenting with different techniques of how I was going to make this mesh. The important thing to remember when doing this is that your painting will show the highlights and the crevices. So your base mesh doesn't need to look exactly like it should in the long run. Uh, so you've got to paint on those lines, paint on those highlights. Uh, so you can see here, um, originally I started with lots of bricks and sort of piled them up, but I think the poly count was too high really, and it wasn't necessary. Uh, so I looked at it again and thought, well, I'm going to do this all with one mesh. Also, I'm repeating meshes where I can. A lot of the time that will save on texture space. Occasionally I'll uh, paint one model which is very similar to another one, and then I'll bake the texture from that one to the other one, and then just paint those extra details that I need. But that obviously takes up more texture space. The most important thing in this particular project is actually the texture space more than the poly count. You can get away with a fair few, but the texture space, that can get quite tough if you haven't got the texture to work with. So a 512 texture by 512 is quite tough when it comes to some minor details and then you've uh, got really pixelated images when you're painting and that can be quite tough. I'm actually painting on 1024 by 1024 uh, and then it will be squished down to 512 by 512. Uh, but it's better to paint on a higher res because you just get that more detail to work with and then it just becomes a bit more blurry when it's squished down. I should say compressed <laughs> down, not squished down. You can see me unwrapping here. I'm using live unwrap, so when I add the uh, seams, you can see them instantly, generally speaking anyway. Sometimes you need to just re-unwrap. Uh, I'm not sure quite whether that's a glitch or whether that's what I'm doing, uh, but you can see that it's nice in 2.8, uh, that you can select everything in edit mode and unwrap it all together onto one map makes things much easier. So there you can see the final model. It's uh, fairly straightforward, ready for painting and uh, low poly. And you can see the wireframe just here as well. So trying to keep those polygons down as low as possible, but to give me enough information to paint on. I would have liked to use the plugin, which is a UV mapping plugin, um, but it just doesn't seem to work on my system. I've seen other people have the same sort of problem uh, and the same glitches, uh, but it's not a big problem because I actually quite like to have a bit of spare UV space in case I fi figure out something in the model that needs adjusting and I need some spare texture space just to add a texture in. On a recent model I was working on, I forgot a whole entire model in the set and I had to try and find texture space all over the place to fit it in. It worked in the end, so that was okay, uh, but it just goes to show it's kind of helpful to have a bit of space. So you can see I've moved on to the textures now and I'm just highlighting the edges and crevices. It's sort of the simple way to that I do every model, it seems. Um, I usually sort of block out colors or fill in the colors first and then add some variation to those colors. So dab on a few separate uh, different colors that are variations on that main color. So you can see lots of different grays and a few sort of purpley grays, bluey grays and so forth. Then I highlight, um, in fact, then I um, do the crevices in this one because they're bricks, so I like to know where the bricks are. It's a bit like uh, when you're doing a sketch uh, and you have a black pencil uh, and you're uh, marking out where the shadow is in a sense, uh, and you sort of highlight areas. That's exactly what I'm doing on the model. So I highlight where the shadow is going to go, then where the highlights are going to go with a lighter brush, and then I do sort of details in between. Just sort of creating uh, swirly shapes on the rocks. That usually works as sort of the uh, crevices and the ridges, the grain of a rock, as it were. 
and it seems to work quite well. I feel like I went very strong on my highlight here. I usually use a slightly softer brush or a lower strength brush, uh, but I really wanted to push the boundaries in terms of uh, the contrast between the light and dark areas. So I thought I've got to experiment a bit more. I like to experiment just a touch with um, every piece, just move on that little bit and try something new out. Uh, it may fail, but it's only been sort of five minutes wasted and I'll have learned something because even whilst I'm doing these projects, I still want to learn and improve all the time. So the same thing for this aspect of the model. I have got it on the uh, principal BSDF uh, where I can see the edges and then I switch between that and the emission shader where you don't see the edges. Uh, lots of people have been telling me there's quicker ways to do it, but actually I find it very quick to do just to uh, go to the uh, main texture, press control shift, and then I've got flat shading uh, with the principal shader and uh, just emission shader. It gives me that no shading look, which will be the end result, of course. So same process again, uh, finding those crevices, uh, marking out exactly where my stones are going to be, then doing the highlights, and then just going in and doing a bit of variation character. And uh, the main sort of ambient occlusion I sort of paint in here. As you can see, I'll go around and add that all in. And these are all joined together. I did actually separate the um, bowls in the end, but I modeled them uh, originally. They were all part of one mesh. It was just easier to paint them as a separate mesh. Then I could fill it in without having to highlight some faces and so forth, which is just a bit more time consuming. You have to be very careful when you've got a mirror uh, to not add too much detail and too much character because that's obviously going to be mirrored across to the other sides. So in this case, it will be mirrored four times. So although I really want to go in, add that really cool character to these things, you have to be very careful doing that because it will just show up loads. So you can see there it's mirrored across the other side, that sort of dent in the rock. And it's just about passable because it's one small uh, crevice there, but too many of those and it's really noticeable. So you can see it's slowly coming together. I'm using the smudge brush a fair bit because when I'm painting, if I hit a corner, it suddenly highlights that corner because it doesn't go round the corners in a sense of the brush. I think that is a bit of a limitation with the texture brushing in Blender. I don't really know how they'd get around that because I'm not a sort of a developer, but um, I feel like, or I've heard that other programs uh, don't have those sort of glitchy issues. Now, one thing I'm finding very tough with this sort of modular design is metal because metal will sort of reflect a light somewhere in your scene. And when you're hand painting, you tend to sort of fake that. So you'd put some highlights on one side as if the sun was sort of hitting it. Uh, well, obviously with hand painted stuff, especially when it's been mirrored, you can't really do that. So you have to be a bit careful. Now with metal, your highlights should be the same color as the metal, which is why we have on the principled shader, we have that metallic slider that makes the reflected light or the highlights, they give off a bit of the color from the actual material. So uh, you shouldn't go too white with your highlights, otherwise it will look like a dielectric material. But you can see what I'm doing with the highlights here, and that gives it that sort of metallic look. And that is what's quite tough when you've got a mirrored object because you get that highlight going round. In this case, it's always on the outside, so it doesn't really make much sense, but you don't notice those things. You have to fake a lot when you're hand painting uh, because you're faking the lighting. So now onto the eagle and starting to paint these feathers. And this is kind of fun really because this is something new that I haven't done before. Uh, so really wanted to experiment a bit here and find out how and what was going to work the best and what wasn't. Now I was tempted to actually paint or shade in the edge around the edge, but that doesn't really make any sense. And then I figured that out as I went along that I don't need to actually draw the feathers around the edge. You can see me smudging them out there and you have to highlight those obviously. It sounds obvious, but uh, you have to sort of experiment a bit and work these things out in your head sometimes. You can see I'm repeating the textures here and using them for my uh, broken down Eagle Temple there, or ruined temple. And you can see me changing the mesh and that's fine to change the mesh and I've got a tiny bit that I have to fill in. So I uh, just copy another bit of the texture space and that's fine. Uh, you can get away with things like that, especially if they're on the back of the model. It's very likely that these models are going to be viewed from one angle. You can move around the models, but it's more likely that they'll be viewed from the front angle. So although I am very careful throughout the model, the back side is the side that I'm not as worried about as the front side. However, I am very aware that the 
player can actually turn around these models, so I do need the backside looking okay. So you can see me again copying and pasting these things and moving them across to the other side. And in this case, there was obviously a texture um, from where I'd painted on some ambient occlusion, so I couldn't really use it like that, so I had to sort of adapt it slightly and know that it would be changing the UVs on the old one as well. So the sharing UVs does have its limitations, but I think I got away with it in this case. Moving it around and uh, distorting a model, you've got to be careful with, again, because of the UVs. And you can see here, I have suddenly realized, oh, I'm not going to be able to see that other side. So I need to put the back end of the eagle in there as well. And I used a few rocks to hide the texture because it just seemed a little bit light where it should be dark. So I just put a few rocks in there uh, to make it look a bit better. I did some adaptation to the mesh as well. You have to be very careful there though. You can use edge slide because that doesn't move your UVs, but adapting the model too much and it will stretch your mesh. So there we have it, the Eagle Temple. Hopefully you're enjoying this series. Do check out my playlist if you want to see more. Do leave a comment with any questions you have. I'm trying to go through them slowly in each episode to give some sort of tips and tricks. And thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.